Kara, my name is Maike and I'm doing my PhD at the HIT Lab. And for that, I'm working on virtual reality math games for learning in schools. Oops, yeah. To create this game, I have derived game elements from different areas, such as game design, XR design, also educational science, psychology, and sociology. The approach of the game is very simple. It's a simple equations game. You can see here on the top right, this is the game. Cubes mark numbers and balls mark the operators, and both must be thrown into the right order to meet a certain target number. Before the children enter the main game room, there are also four training rooms. I will elaborate more on that in a bit. I want to design this game inclusive to all children, including children that struggle with hyperactivity and attention. And this is why we are so great, because it allows for movement in, in a controlled environment. I have tested that game already on 15 children in the school in Christchurch here in New Zealand. You can see here, this is the training room in the making. I used Unity 2020, and there were four training rooms in total. This one portrays um, the, the, the throwing mechanism, so children learn in this room to pick up the cubes and the balls and to throw them in their, into their respective snap zones. This is the game again. You can see here the, the picture on the bottom. It represents the snap zones, and then on top, left you can see the game room itself the main resource from the question is into interviews where that the average time of completion for the training rooms was three minutes and five seconds which was considered fast progression all 15 participants indicated that they liked the training rooms and also that they felt really good good or brilliant doing the training itself 13 children would train again in the training room and 13 would 14 would play the game again as well children liked about the game that they could throw the cubes and the balls so that that movement was really liked. They liked teleporting, the learning of the game controls, that they had the freedom to explore, that they received some support, figuring out the math equations, especially finishing a question, and the simplicity of the environment. Children didn't really enjoy doing math in itself, bright colors, the difficulty level of the equations, and also hand in hand with that not being able to finish an equation in a given time. The main results from the observations were that most children, um, sorry, that some children try to move outside the defined play area. So that is something for the future to consider. And some children show difficulties comprehending signs and labels. Also three children completed the first equation of the game, which appeared to have them very engaged and motivated by their success. Four children did not, uh, four children did talk to themselves in outstanding amount during the training itself, also especially during solving the equation. And in stark contrast to that, three participants did not talk at all during their time in VR. So it is very interesting. No participants showed any significant difficulty to navigate the virtual space. And eight participants navigated the space noticeably intuitively. So that was really a great find as well. For the future improvements that I've derived from, from the observations and um, the qualitative data is that I want to simplify the equations in the game itself allow larger space as the play area so children are not as tempted to move out of the space. And I want to simplify text-based instructions and instructional science. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. You can see me doing the user study in action on the right here. This is uh, yeah, just me with one or two participants. Thank you very much for listening to me. Hi, my name is Miriam Luque Chipana. I am a first year PhD student in the HIT lab. And my research is about situational awareness in multimodal mixed reality multiplayer sports. Augmented and virtual reality are now being used in sports for display information, interacting with fans, improving attendance training, and in game performance. Multiplayer sports are competitive environments that often need the athlete take quick decisions based on the action of their opponent and the overall game situation. Multimodal mixed reality multiplayer sports allow to have some players in virtual reality, giving them a completely artificial environment, while others can connect using augmented reality, which keep them anchored in the real world. To play against each other, Athletes need to be aware of each other's activity and environment in these different modalities. Situational awareness is the perception of these elements in the environment and the understanding why they represent and how these elements will change in the future. Having a good situational awareness in sports helps players 
make better decisions based on the circumstances of the game and the develop a strategy to win it. Situational awareness in how a game develops it can be also affected by athletes' experience. Difference in skills and experience can cause the game not to develop on equal terms. We propose to investigate and implement techniques to enhance situational awareness, seeking to improve experience and game balance in multimodal mixed reality. We plan to research how we can support situational perception, understanding, and prediction in augmented and virtual reality. Furthermore, we aim to observe how situational awareness is affected by multimodal mixed reality and how this could enable a better development of multiplayer sports. On the other hand, we will try to make use of situational awareness as a tool to equalize game conditions based on the experience and capabilities of the player, regardless of the modality that is being used to interact in the game. Thanks. Hello everyone, my name is Leon and I'm a master's student in HitLab. I'm going to give a short summary of my research project, which is about using augmented reality for real-time feedback to enhance the execution of strength training. The problem with the current situation is the risk of serious injury and lacking, lacking of engagement are important factors causing people to do a lesser amount of exercise. Using AR technology can provide a more enjoyable and engaging experience. However, the latest AR exercise products does not provide personalized real-time visual feedback, so it still has a risk of injuries. Therefore, I developed a prototype that can provide personalized visual feedback in four different types, which are traffic, arrow, avatar, and all in one. To narrow down the scope of research area, my prototype is focusing on reducing errors in squat, especially knee collapsing towards inside. For traffic visual feedback, when the participant good, do good squat, then it shows green light. If the knee starts to bend inside, then it shows yellow light as a warning sign. If knee goes further, then it shows red light. The error visual feedback shows errors when knee starts to collapse. The further knee goes, the bigger the errors are. For avatar visual feedback, the vest squat form is of the participant is recorded, and the recorded visual video is overlaid on screen so the participant can follow their avatar. Finally, all-in-one is a combination of all these visual types. The aim of this prototype project is to find out which visual feedback is the most effective. For the user test, the participant did 10 squats for each type of visual feedback. While the participants are doing the squats, the performance was measured. After each visual feedback, the participant completed user experience questionnaire, and finally, a short interview was done at the end of the experiment. The result of UEQ performance and preference measures are shown in the slide. UEQ shows that the order of attractiveness and efficiency is traffic, error, win one, and avatar, which is the same order in preference measure as well. However, in performance measure, it shows that the participants improved their performance the most with error, followed by O in one, then traffic. The avatar was, the found, avatar was found to be the worst visual feedback overall. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mac, and I'm a master's student here at the Hit Lab New Zealand. My research explores how we can use everyday objects in augmented reality. My master specifically covered user-defined interaction using everyday objects for augmented reality first-person action games. In augmented and virtual reality, often virtual content is only displayed visually by adding touch to the experience. You can make that experience better and more immersive uh, and make these virtual objects seem more real. Interfaces that provide this sense of touch are called tangible user interfaces. Using everyday objects as tangible user interfaces provides a cheaper option 
than using dedicated hardware. Plus it can bring a novel gameplay experience to the table. My research aims to bring these everyday objects to life and form a foundation or recommendation for people designing uh, AI games using everyday objects in the future. For my masters, I ran an elicitation study where participants would select an everyday object for a range of three virtual objects, a sword, a shield, and a crossbow. Participants performed a short game task with each object, and I measured their immersion during the experience, as well as conducting a short interview once the participants were done with all tasks. My study found that while there was some agreement for the sword and the shield, none of the most popularly selected objects necessarily provided a better experience than any of the remaining everyday objects. I also identified a few key factors that went into people selecting their objects. Uh, grip feel, weight distri distribution, as well as size and shape. Participants also gave good feedback about how these experiences could be improved in the future. Going forward, I plan to continue my research into bringing everyday objects to life uh, and start a PhD here at the HitLab New Zealand. I'll leave you with a short video that covers the uh, study experience. <clears throat> with augmented reality, we can now realize the childlike experience of having everyday objects come to life. An ordinary spatula transforms to strike down your foes. A frying pan, now able to defend you from enemy attacks. And a spray bottle that allows you to defeat your enemies at range. Hi, my name's Zoe. I'm an audiologist and PhD student here at the HITLAB. Here in New Zealand, we have about 3,000 deaf and hard of hearing kids in the education system that we know about with really high needs. Half of those kids are Māori or Pacifica, and almost all of them attend their local mainstream school and have hearing families. So they grow up without any deaf role models and no way to sort of figure out how to advocate for themselves or form a positive deaf identity. This can lead to social isolation and a range of preventable really negative outcomes. For a class assignment as part of my Master of Audiology degree here at UC, I conceptualised a role-playing game simulating different situations um, out in the wider community uh, to give deaf teens an uh, opportunity to practice these situations as they start to become more independent and sort of mobile out in the wider world. I also really like the idea of giving these kids some agency and autonomy in their own learning journey. Um, so much happens to them from usually white hearing adult professionals. I was fortunate to raise a bunch of money from business competitions and grants and published a simple 2D version of this game in 2019. The specific learning outcomes of this game are all grounded in the psychology and uh, habilitation literature and also incorporating lived experience from successful deaf adults. What it all boils down to is giving these kids the tools to identify their needs and advocate for them and feeling confident about that in a clear and friendly way. Now, the pandemic has brought communication challenges for all of us, especially to deaf and hard of hearing people. And for my PhD, I'm gonna be updating this resource and forming long-term relationships to make sure that it's culturally bound and effective. I'm also going to be validating it in clinical trials. I hope to utilize some of the really awesome technology we have here available at the HIT Lab. Uh, for example, with motion capture and um, hyper-realistic avatars, we can finally have realistic sign language that includes all the prosody and non-manual features and really realistic and engaging so we can open up 
a range of interactive media that was previously inaccessible to deaf kids. So we know that games can be really powerful tools for learning and I hope that they can help us overcome the geographical and social um, barriers to accessing hearing healthcare and also a community here in Aotearoa. Hi, I'm Dilshani Kumar Rupeli. I'm a PhD student at HITLAB New Zealand. So my PhD research topic is Aota Expression Transformation for Preserving Identity in Rich Collaborations. So let's have a look what I'm going to do with this research. So with this research, I'm going to introduce a new intelligent privacy middleware engine to protect users' verbal and nonverbal privacy according to their preferences. Uh, so with this middleware engine, I'm going to consider relationship between the collaborators, task requirements, user preferences to convert facial expressions, speech, body movements and controller movement into alert expressions, speech output and avatar movements. So with this uh, int uh, intelligent privacy middleware engine, I'm going to basically introduce three new filters. Masking filter, hiding filter, and generalization filter. So, purpose of these filters is to protect users' identity from automatic uh, behavioral-based identity uh, detection algorithms, and also to smoothly transform inappropriate user expressions into more appropriate expressions by changing or completely replacing certain expressions according to user preferences. Um, when it comes to the security and privacy software development standard, there is always this contradiction between the security and privacy properties. Because when it comes to the security, user uh, security developers always need to find the relationship between certain users and their data. But when it comes to the privacy uh, developer standards, it is always uh, preferred to have this separation of user identity and user data. So there is always this contradiction between these two features, but using this kind of a privacy middleware engine, we could provide this perfect balance between security and privacy because users could log into the system using their credentials while having all the security features, but inside the application, they could have the desired level of privacy according to their preferences from behavior, from revealing their behaviors. So I'm going to introduce this uh, privacy uh, engine uh, as a library or a plugin. So application developers could integrate this new middleware into this, into their applications. So if any application developer is going to integrate this uh, new middleware layer, into their applications, they will have the foundation to be compliant with certain privacy software development standards such as Linden or Chris methods or even ISO 27701. Uh, so this is what I'm going to do with my PhD research. Uh, thank you so much for your time and I'm looking forward to discuss this uh, research topic with you all. Thank you so much. I'm Hayden, a master's student at the Hit Lab New Zealand. My research presents a method of simulating racket impact forces for extra games. My research is hoping to improve player engagement in extra games with the novel haptic feedback method that simulates impact forces by generating torque impulses, such as those you might experience by hitting a ball with a tennis racket or a cricket bat. Extra games are a type of video game that make players physically exert themselves. They have applications in recreation, exercise, education, and rehabilitation. So far, my research has been focused on the development of this handheld motion track device that can generate torque impulses. The main components of note are the two high-speed flywheels hidden inside these cylinders that you can see here. You can see the mechanism in action generating a torque impulse in this video. So to explain what just happened there, in the starting configuration, the cylinders or the flywheels are aligned vertically and are spinning in opposite directions. This means that the angle of momentum that they produce cancel each other out because they're spinning in opposite directions. Then when they snap into the second configuration, 
they realign so that they're now spinning in the same direction and their angular momentums are adding together instead of cancelling out. This quick change from cancelling out to adding together produces the reaction torque impulse that the user feels. The tracking device on top allows the device to be used in place of a bat or a racket in a virtual reality exo game, like this one. This is um, some footage of the bat being used in a virtual reality exo game, where the player hits cricket balls with a virtual cricket bat. In the simulation, um, the balls hit the bat and the haptic device is triggered, so the user feels the impact of the ball through the handle of the device. A version of this exo game is going to be used to, in a user study to evaluate the device's effect on player engagement. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Tim McKenzie, a PhD student here at the University of Canterbury, studying with the School of Product Design, Computer Science and Software Engineering Department in the Human Interface Technology Lab. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you today about my project on video game development. Uh, the stories behind them, uh, particularly games in New Zealand, and addressing the challenges that come up in the process. Uh, but games are just for fun, right? Well, why should we care? Well, video games are big. Uh, the worth more than music and movies combined twice over. A third of humanity are gamers, and during the world pandemic, the World Health Organization recommended gaming uh, as a way to find community, to socialize, and address mental health. Uh, games are uh, used in education and in implied areas, and increasingly humans are using them more than just to entertain themselves, but to explore more issues and uh, find socialization and things like that. Uh, so the influence of games can't be overstated. But most game development projects fail. Why? Well, games are a very complex mixture of art and music and film production and engineering, design and business. And so the root causes aren't in the technology, but in the multidisciplinary team dynamics and project ma management. And little empirical research has been done in the industry. Uh, often students are rather secretive, and they don't let outsiders in. And often they don't understand what their own practices are either. And so I'm here uh, to sort of shine a light, uh, and that's my project. Uh, to investigate, to talk to, to watch game developers do their craft. And the result would be in an empirical game development model. Um, so we're exploring the different con contextual factors behind games. So the business, the, the, the players, the projects, the process, um, the, the products that they make, uh, and how they organize their people. And then what drives the, the game developers in terms of their success goals, whether it's for profit, for the quality of the game, for the visibility of the studio. And then looking at their way of working, of those, all those different crafts from art and narrative and, and music and that sort of thing. And what kind of uh, production processes they use, whether it's agile or things from creative production. And then looking at the outcomes of these different projects. What things that they learnt, what went well, what went wrong. And actually finding the links between those different factors to see what are the root causes of some of these issues. And what are the practices that they used to overcome them. And so it's all about exploring their context, describing their projects, explaining those different relationships, and proposing best practices. Uh, now, in terms of the progress so far, uh, we've conducted a, a literature review and found over 200 uh, papers describing game development. Uh, we've had a year-long case study uh, observing a studio make a game. We've uh, put on an online survey, and uh, up to 10 game projects already have uh, been documented there and we're interviewing as many game developers as we can. And we're also going to conferences like the NZGC, as you see here, uh, to meet and greet game developers and find out about their stories. If you're interested about my project, please contact me at timothy.mckenzie at pg.canterbury.ac.nz. Thank you. Hello, I'm Chris. Uh, I'm a PhD student here in the HitLab New Zealand and I would like to introduce my research work. So my research is about interactive uh, storytelling techniques for cinematic virtual reality. So cinematic virtual reality, or called CVR for short, is a type of storytelling experience that uses a virtual reality as its a medium, and its purpose is to tell a relatively long and complete story that's getting the perfect cinematic. 
And then because CVR is immersive environment and the story happens in there, and then there comes some challenges such as the creators still want authorial control because it's a story, but viewers become immersive in there and they will like some uh, participation or interaction, this which is different from other forms. And then those conflict become problems such as the narrative paradox or the issue of fear of missing out. And then I try to explore how can I solve this problem. And I uh, planned my research in three different stages to look at different angles, such as the way to uh, guide users' attention in immersive environment because they might lost the way, and also design to cope with viewer interaction if they want to participate and expect some agency. And then I'm looking at storytelling personalization. So the studies I contacted, in the first one, I proposed this gesture-based a directorial cue called action units to see if it is effective um, to guide the viewer's attention in the 360 video and it turns out it does and then it's been diegetic and people like it because it does not break the presence. And also I designed a virtual lab guided tour to test if viewers would like to control the narrative progress by themselves and whether they want like to explicit interact with the system or do it more implicitly. And then uh, the result tells us that it de depends on the design, whether you want to invoke this emotional experience, I would like to um, like encourage them to explore more. And then the third stage, I work with a Maori storytellers locally from New Zealand to see if we can um, create the face-to-face -face exper uh, storytelling experience by creating this personalization uh, features that the storytelling uh, changes a little bit depends on who you are and your backgrounds and your preference like that and then this stage is still on the process but generally the research results from all three will be combined into a framework for CVR creators who want to create a storytelling experience that has viewer interaction would like to have the viewers find themselves more engaged and then um, find themselves participating in the story and in the environment that they are being regarded part of it so that's um, the final result I'm looking at and that's all thank you Hi everyone, my name is Steve Wheeler. I'm a PhD student at the HIT Lab. I'm originally from the UK and started my PhD in April of last year. Uh, but as of last month, I uh, finally arrived in New Zealand. Um, my research focuses on using virtual reality technology to train New Zealand firefighters for high risk and high cost scenarios. So more specifically, I'm looking at ground wildfire firefighting uh, instead of aerial firefighting or firefighting in uh, urban environments. Um, wildfires, unfortunately, are a growing threat. Uh, for example, occurrences of wildfires in New Zealand have increased from 2,000 wildfires in 1985 to 1986, uh, the season, to just under 6,000 in the 2019 to 2020 season. As part of a global trend in the increase of wildfires in their severity, uh, for example, in 2017, Portugal experienced the largest and most devastating wildfire in the country's history. In 2018, uh, British Columbia experienced the largest quantity of wildfires on record, while California experienced on separate occasions its most significant, most destructive and deadliest wildfires. Uh, with this trend set to continue in the future, uh, adequate training in combating and controlling wildfires is of the utmost importance uh, now more than ever. Uh, so how can VR help? Um, Due to the inherent dangers of firefighting, uh, practical training can be hazardous to both instructors and trainers alike, <clears throat> and expensive due to the cost of resources and equipment. Uh, virtual reality technology has been used to train personnel in many fields. It's found application in teaching of correct safety procedures in uh, hazardous situations, stress inoculation training with soldiers, uh, and as a teaching tool in the manufacturing industry. Um, VR can transport the user to an almost real, safe uh, virtual training environment that can be modified and observed by the educator. Uh, as a high sense of presence in virtual environments has been shown to arouse uh, behavior and psychological responses on par with real life, and training transfer in virtual environments has been shown to have the potential to be on par with real life activities, um, VR shows promise in being an effective and ecologically valid alternative to real life training exercises. 
And finally, uh, what I have done and doing and will do, I've published a review of immersive VR firefighter training uh, in Frontiers of Virtual Reality. I've analyzed design methodologies for creating effective virtual learning environments. Uh, I've compiled data on the identity and needs of firefighters, so like their motivations, frustrations, their day-to-day -day life effectively. And I have started creating a VR training simulation that is based on traditional training materials, so uh, textbook and video content. Uh, that's it. I hope it was entertaining and uh, thanks for watching.